You like my shoes, yeah. I'm going to sit this year because I don't have a whole lot of energy right now. Uh, good Mormon, everybody. <laughs> Some of you guys caught that. Some of you need another thing of coffee. Old joke. Old joke, yeah. How, how many of you guys have not heard the impossible gospel before? Choking. Rob Butterfield, come on. <laughs> really? Everybody here has heard it? That is crazy. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> now, uh, a little bit about myself before we jump into something. First off, we're going to do, do something old, old school and new school. Old school in the sense that I don't have a PowerPoint presentation for you guys. So you're going to have to bump each other and keep each other awake. New school in that I've got a video that I want to show. <clears throat> but before I do that, uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Keith Walker. Becky and I started Evidence Ministries in 1995. Uh, I'm a full-time missionary to both uh, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, so I'm bicultural. Um, and it's really good because I'm able to use things, and I did it last week. I was able to talk about JWs with Mormons and talk about things that apply to both groups and they can look at the JWs and go, ooh, that's wrong. And then later on, of course, you know, I trust the Holy Spirit to bring it to their mind of, yeah, ooh, that's wrong. But that also applies to me. So that's kind of handy. Um, we've been uh, full-time missionaries since 1999. This is my 18th year here in Manti. This is the absolute highlight of my year. It really is. I get to see family that I only see once a year. And some of you guys are, are, are closer to me than, any, than, than people in San Antonio. And we've lived there for, uh, for a while. I told, uh, I told somebody last night, I forget who it was, mission team came in from Provo, I think it was, and I was sta standing next to Aaron and I said, we're blood brothers. It's just not our blood. And that's kind of how I feel about uh, you guys here this morning is, is that's what this is. This is this is like a family reunion. I mean, I'd still come if the Mormons weren't here because, you know, we love you guys. So uh, I think that's enough. Oh, two things. We've got uh, T-shirts out there on the table. The T-shirts work. They really do. I don't. In fact, I only used to create the T-shirts for our team and didn't start creating more T-shirts until we started getting requests for them. People liked our T-shirts and, uh, and they saw that they actually did work in, uh, in conversations. This one here, how many of you guys have seen The Princess Bride? Okay, it is a cult classic in more ways than one. But this is the word uh, Greek, or, um, it's a Greek word for grace, charis. I had Rob Bowman help me with that. And then I had uh, Sir Roadheaver um, do the image for me. And of course, Inigo Montoya is saying, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is with the word with grace, with Mormonism. So they may come up and ask, you know, what is that word? And then instantly you're in a conversation. They have different definitions of grace. Uh, so we've got those out on the table. We also have a newsletter sign-up sheet. I didn't want to pass that out, but you can stop at the table if you want to, to get on our newsletter. It's a free monthly thing that we send out. It's really two parts. The first part tells you kind of what we've been up to for the last month. And then the last part is a short article on either Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. And we call it Backpacks and Briefcases. Anybody know why we call our newsletter that? There you go. That's because that's how you figure out who they are is because Mormons wear backpacks. You know why? Because you can't ride a bike with a briefcase. So when they show up at your door and you want to know which group you're talking with, well, that kind of gives it away. It's either the backpack or the briefcase. Although one time I did have some Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door in white shirts, ties and backpacks. And and when they mentioned the watchtower, I, I literally did this. You know, because it's like, oh, wrong cult. You know, I didn't say that. <laughs> but that's what went through my mind was like, oh, man, I got to get this straight. So you got to be careful with that. 
So anyway, if, if you're not on our newsletter uh, list, sign up for that. It's free, and, uh, and we'd really appreciate you keeping in contact with us. All right, so now uh, the new school stuff. The video that you're going to see here was shot by Eric Johnson in the back there. He's with Mormonism Research Ministry. Although what happened is somebody must have copied it from his channel because I don't know who this person is from the video that we're going to watch. But this guy titled it something like, oh, does it? Okay, angry, angry Mormon and patient Christian. And I think it's amazing that he called it that because I deal with a lot of uh, ex-Mormons and ex-Jehovah's Witnesses who are atheists. And they'll watch this video or see how I dialogue with people online or things like that. And they say, you know, you are an incredibly patient person. And I say, you know, it's very ironic that you say that because that's how I know there's a God. <laughs> because I am not an incredibly patient person. This is completely God that you see. So the video itself is about 40 minutes long. Um, Eric came in at about, I had probably talked with this couple for about a, a half hour before he came in. So we're only going to watch about the first li little bit less than five minutes of this video. And then I'm going to explain why I showed the video. So let me get out of the way and go ahead and start that.
<laughs> that was an extremely boring conversation. Yeah, um, I have I have had the privilege to uh, to be there when someone came to know the Lord, and aside from those conversations, that was by far the most memorable conversation I've ever had with the Mormon. Um, I love guys like that. I absolutely love guys like that because they are going to stand for what they believe in and they will argue with you until they get it. And I mean, give me an honest Mormon any day. Even if they're angry, give me an honest or angry Mormon any day because that, I, I was literally sweating at the end of that conversation because let me tell you, that was work. This guy, a uh, Mormon cowboy, um, and, and just an incredible uh, conversation. Please pray for him. The girl that jumped in, uh, that was his girlfriend, and she claimed to be a Christian, not understanding the differences between Mormonism and Christianity. So when I started off the conversation, I started off, uh, and this might sound weird, okay? But when it comes to protecting the flock and reaching the lost, I would rather protect the flock. That's me. Because the way I see it is the flock itself is what's going to be able to reach more people than individual me reach one single Mormon. So I was, I was more worried for her than I was for him. And it, it became obvious to me uh, that I don't think, I think she was a nominal Christian. I don't think she, she really had placed faith in Christ. So at that point, I started treating both of them as if they were LDS. And then he kind of took over the conversation as, as you saw. Um, but the reason why I show that is because I'm going to go through uh, an outline. Uh, I did not come up with the impossible gospel of Mormonism. I only named it. I learned this approach from guys like uh, Bill McKeever, um, Timothy Oliver, Tim Martin, and some unknown dude in the park in Manti, in, in City Park in Manti. He went through a number of quotes with us out of the Miracle of Forgiveness. And this was very early in our ministry when I was not... I was not as educated on Mormonism as I am now. So I learned this approach through other people. So early in 2000 something, when Chip had asked me to speak here, I, I just named it the impossible gospel. So that's kind of what everybody calls the approach, but I did not come up with it. So I want to make that clear. But it really took off when uh, Chip wrote his book and included one of my outlines in his chapter on the book. And you can get it on his table. It's the Mormon Scrapbook. Uh, in, in my mind, that is, is one of the top three books that you can get on how to learn how to witness to Mormons and understand uh, what they believe. Top three? Top three? Come on, that's good. <clears throat> I got Eric Johnson in the room here, too. I got to be careful. So... Anyway, get the book, because it's a good book. And if Eric has anything on our table, get his stuff too, right, Eric? That's right, amen. That's right, amen. Okay, so the reason why I wanted to show that video is because what has happened, and, I, and I've been telling my teams this for the last couple of years because I noticed a problem that people, it's a trap that they tend to fall into when they're teaching the impossible gospel. And it was something that, <coughs> excuse me, it was something that, um, that Kelsey actually mentioned yesterday when she said that the approaches and the tools that we use, those, it's not a script, okay? We're not to treat it like a script. We're not to treat this outline that I have here as a script. In other words, you don't have to start with Moroni 1032 and end with Alma 34, although that is what I'm going to do today. I've had conversations where I've actually started with Alma 34. And those of you who are familiar with Alma 34 are thinking, okay, that's a really weird place to start. But that was where I believe the Holy Spirit was telling me to begin my conversation with these it was three or four teenage kids um, in, uh, in Nauvoo, Illinois. So there's nothing magical about this approach. It is not the best way to reach Mormons. There are lots of good ways to reach Mormonism, or Mormons. This is just one of them. And it doesn't have to be done in the order that I'm going through. It's just that the way my mind works, I'm a very systematic, logical thinker. So I put it together in a way that just makes sense to me. Now, I have had conversations that did go right down the outline. I mean, they brought up the, the exact objection 
that it just, just happens to be in, in my outline. I had a guy that I was witnessing with once who was on my team, and he pointed that out to me after this hour-long conversation we had to this Mormon guy. He said, Keith, that went perfectly. I said, what do you mean perfectly? He said, it went point by point in your outline, because I'm holding the outline watching you go through this. And he said exactly what he, you said he was going to say in the order that you said he was going to say it. <laughs> now, that's not normal, okay? And, and if it doesn't happen that way, then, then don't think that you're doing it wrong. Remember, this is a conversation. Conversations are two ways. This is not an outline that you rush through to try to get them to the next verse so that you can prove your point. Because nobody likes to be preached at in that sense. So keep it a conversation. In fact, most of my witnessing opportunities, I, do, I probably do more listening than I do actual speaking. And the reason why I do that is because I'm allowing the Mormon to tell me what's important to them so that I can then ask questions to direct the conversation in the way that they're telling me they want to go. My son and I were uh, talking with a Mormon guy uh, two nights ago, and we were talking about the nature of God, and then all of a sudden he starts talking about forgiveness so I shifted. I shifted from my approach, God is not a man, to the impossible gospel, because that was what was important to him at that time. So I can't overemphasize enough that this is just a tool. This is, it's not a script. You don't have to follow it word by word, line by line, precept by precept, you know, the way the Mormons put it. Um, so take what works for you, throw away the rest, come up with your own questions. Uh, there's nothing, again, there's nothing magical about the approach. So, how many of you have uh, smartphones? All right, keep your hands up. Those of you who do have smartphones, how many of you have the LDS Gospel Library on it? Okay, those of you who put your hands down, you need to put your hands back up after you download the, uh, the LDS Gospel Library because it is, it is a great tool to use. I've got it, you can use it on Google and Apple devices. I used to have a book bag with me, and it was kind of awkward sometimes. So, you know, well, let me find my teachings of the prophets Joseph Smith and my lectures on faith and my miracle of forgiveness. This is what I use now, just my iPad. All I've got out there is my iPad and my camera. And it's so much easier to witness with that tool, with their own app, because you, open, you know, you got the coolness factor of the iPad, right? You whip out the iPad and you look official. And then when they see that you're using the app that a lot of them use themselves, instant credibility. They already know that they, they know the source, they know where it's come from, and you don't have to spend time defending the information that you're looking at because they can download the stuff right then and there if they want to. So it is an, an incredibly effective tool to use. In fact, I don't know, maybe one day I might put up a YouTube video and show you guys exactly how to use the gospel library in a way that you can set it up for good conversations with folks. So, all right, uh, there are three parts mainly to the impossible gospel of Mormonism. We've got our attitude, we've got our approach, and we've got the answers. And sometimes we're too quick to give the answer. We just want to go right to Jesus before the Mormon understands their position before him. So we'll preach the gospel to them, and a lot of times they'll agree with us. They'll say, exactly right. I agree with every word that you said. Unfortunately, what they don't understand is because we use the same terminology or similar terminology, we aren't using the same dictionary. So they're not understanding that. So don't rush to give the answer. And again, there's nothing magical about the approach. But what I do think is, is probably more important than the approach and the answer is your attitude. Because... We can get in the way of the message that we're preaching. Now, I'm not going to say that you're going to be at fault for somebody going to hell because you didn't preach the gospel right. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we can do a disservice if we, with our bad attitudes, treat Mormons the wrong way. And uh, like maybe the second or third year that I came here, there was a guy from Las Vegas. We're only going to refer to him as Tank because that's kind of what he looked like. He was one of those no-neck bowling ball kind of guys. 
And that was his approach. He just rolled right over people. And there was a crowd of people. There was one Mormon talking to this Christian. And he was kind of prowling around on the outside and, and kind of came up behind the Mormon. And the Mormon said something, and it was almost like he whispered in his ear, but it wasn't a whisper because I could hear it. And he kind of leaned over to his ears and said, that's why your beliefs are going to lead you to hell. I have an anger problem. Sometimes it's righteous, and that night it was. I watched him walk away, and I approached him. And, I mean, he could tell right away. I, I, I do not intimidate easy, easily when people try to intimidate me. I literally laugh. But for some reason, I am intimidating <laughs> to people like that. I walked right up to him, and I said, what in the world are you doing? He said, I'm out here preaching the gospel to Mormons. I said, really, you love Mormons? He said, yeah. I said, do you think that guy knows it? Because when you told him you, he was going to hell, it sounded like you were happy about it. Are you? And he says, no. And I, um, I'm going to mix metaphors here. I slapped him a new one. All right? Tore him a new one. Because, and in love. But I was angry, and he knew it. He knew that what he did was wrong in the way that he treated the Mormon. Now, I have told Mormons that they're going to hell. But it's usually in a response to a question that they've asked me. And I tell them, are you sure you want the answer to this? You know, I got a smile on my face or a tear in my eye when I'm telling them that. But I'm never happy about that message because that is eternity where unforgiven people go. And if we let our attitude get in the way of that, we have done a disservice to Mormons. I want to illustrate that with a verse. Um, go to Ephesians 4.15. I'm going to read it out of the King James because that's, that's what the Mormons use here. Ephesians 4.15. It says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And he tells us to speak the truth in love, right? Sometimes what I like to do is I like to change Scripture. I know that sounds weird. But I change it so that you can see what it doesn't say. Like John 14, 6. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except, Joseph, except through Joseph Smith. Jesus didn't say that. Okay? But in a way, that's how Mormons think. So if you change the verse to fit their theology and then... You, you speak it to them, it's kind of shocking. So I want to change Ephesians 4.15. Instead of speaking the truth in love, I want to read it as speaking the truth is love. If we treat this verse that way, that speaking the truth is love, what would that imply? This is the audience participation time. What's that? Speaking the truth is love, so what does that imply? Exactly. Doesn't matter what I say or how I say it. It's loving because I'm telling you the truth. But that's not what the verse says. The verse doesn't say speaking the truth is love. It says, it says to do it, and then it tells you how to do it. Speak the truth, but do it in love. Not that speaking the truth is love. And of course, speaking the truth is a loving thing, but we have to make sure that we are doing it in a winsome way that the Mormon understands that we're doing this out of love. And, I, and I've had numerous Mormons tell me, I appreciate you're out here because I understand why you're out here. I don't agree with you. I don't agree with, with what you believe about Mormonism and what you believe about the future of those who are invested in it. But I do understand your heart, and I appreciate you being out here. That's common ground right there, folks, because they're understanding that, that, that we love them as people. And we often tell them how we treat Mormon missionaries when we come or when they come to our homes. I mean, we feed these guys. We've had these guys come over to our house because they were hungry. Seriously, that's not a joke. Four Mormon missionaries went out to lunch. Only three of them had enough uh, money for food. The fourth one sat there and watched the three of them eat. He then came up with a great idea. I know, let's go over to the Walker's house. 
They said, yeah, that's a pretty cool family. Let's go. They came over to our house. And the fourth one just happened to drop that story about, yeah, I didn't get lunch today. Boom, immediately, what's Becky doing? She's in the kitchen. What do you want? We, got le- we, have, a veal call- we have a meal called Verl. Various random leftovers. And the kids ask us, what are we having for dinner? We're having Verl. It's like, okay, you know, whatever that is today. Well, that's what, that's what that Mormon missionary had that day. He had Verl. And he was happy for it. We treat these guys with love, not only at home, but also out there on the streets. Mormons see that. Our attitude is extremely important. Okay, now the approach. The approach, again, the impossible gospel of Mormonism, it's a number of verses out of the Book of Mormon and the Bible, excuse me, and the Doctrine and Covenants. We don't get to the Bible till later. <coughs> excuse me, that's the answer part. Um, but what we do with the, how many of you guys are, for, are, are familiar with formal logic? Okay, got a few of you. All right, you guys know what a reductio ad absurdum is? Yep. It says my son, the 14 year old. Uh, oh, you said that? I'm sorry, you are not my son and you are not 14 years old. <laughs> uh, thought my, my son, forgive me. Basically, uh, to dumb it down, a reductio ad absurdum is you want to start in a certain place with an argument and you follow that argument to its logical conclusion. And if the ending place is a bad place, then your beginning place was a bad beginning. All right, so what you're doing is you're assuming something is true, following it through, and if you end up in a bad argument, you know, in a bad place that doesn't make sense, then, then that means that your starting place is not true. That's what this argument is. The whole impossible gospel argument is, we're not telling Mormons that they're wrong. If you noticed in the video, he even said you, haven't said, you haven't said anything about why I'm wrong or why you're wrong or whatever. You know, all you're doing is questioning me on this stuff when I could get a word in edgewise. <laughs> but that's what we want to do with this approach is I'm not going to come right out and tell them that they're wrong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to imagine that what they say is correct. And we're going to follow it through to its logical conclusion. And if the conclusion ends in a really, really bad place, like maybe impossibility, then that means that the starting place is not a good starting place. We have to start somewhere else. Once the Mormon understands that, then they start asking questions. And that's, excuse me, that's when we can get to the answers. Because now they're asked, instead of, well, what do you believe? It's, well, then how do you think you're forgiven? You could say that same phrase with two completely different tones, one of them is going to get an answer from me and the other one won't because I want to make sure that they're ready to hear that answer. And before they're ready to hear that answer, they've got to understand that they're lost. And I keep, I I say this every year to people, you've got to get them lost before you can get them saved because Mormons believe that, that they are the one true church. They're more, they're more Christian than we are. In fact, they're the only true Christians. We're just apostate Christians. So they have to understand their real condition before God, before their ears are open to hear the real answers. So usually where we start is Moroni 10.32. So if you guys, this is, sounds really weird to say this in a Bible church, but open up your copies of the Book of Mormon to Moroni chapter 10, verse 32. Chip says it's very important to have a copy of the Book of Mormon. Absolutely. That's why I mentioned earlier to, to have that app, if you've got a, a smart device, to be able to have that on there. Um, because Mormons, they, they, their eighth article of faith says that we believe the Bible to be the Word of God insofar that it's translated correctly. And what that really means is if you can show them a verse that disagrees with their Mormon theology, then that's one of those mistranslated verses. So if you've got a Book of Mormon and you can make a point with them out of that, they're never going to question its validity. They may question your interpretation of it, but never its validity. And that's why we encourage people to ask questions. In fact, that's one of the best things you can do is ask questions. Instead of telling them what the verse means, ask them what it means. So you're using their definition. If they're not quite getting the sense of what the verse actually says, ask more clarifying questions so that they can 
finally get you know exactly what it is <coughs> that we're trying to get them to see. Maroon like 1032 says, Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if you shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace you may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God you are perfect in Christ, you can in no wise deny the power of God. Now I will ask them, what does that verse mean? And a lot of times they don't know. They'll just kind of look at it and go, uh, you know, because it is kind of wordy. So I'll just ask them a clarifying question. Did you notice the if-then statement there? That's a conditional statement. Did you notice that? And they'll kind of look for it. And then, so it would be good to, in your copies of the Book of Mormon, underline the if, underline the then. If you do this, then you get this. And then again, you just start asking questions. What are the requirements for grace? There's four things. Love God with all your might, all your mind, all your strength. Deny yourself of all ungodliness. That's the one we want to focus on, is the denial of all ungodliness. But then you ask the question, well, when does the grace apply? Remember, there's that if-then. The then is conditional upon the if. The then does not come first. The if does. If this, then this. So what I, what I want them to see is that they have to, according to their own scriptures, deny themselves of all ungodliness. Now that might not mean much to them, so again, ask more clarifying questions. What would your life look like if you denied yourself of all ungodliness? And I've had people say, well, you know, I guess I'd be a pretty good person. And I say, pretty good? Remember, all ungodliness. You don't have any more ungodliness in your life to deny. What would you be? They, they're telling me. Well, you'd be perfect. And I've had some people say, well, you're trying to make that sound like i got to be perfect. So, no, wait a minute. Can you deny yourself of all ungodliness and be imperfect? Is that possible? Well, no. I had one kid say, what's ungodliness? And I said, well, you know what godliness is? He said, yeah. I said, it's not that. <laughs> he says, oh, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Real simple. I do that to my kids all the time. They hate it. But who's the focus on? If, if what? Who's got to do the work here? That's why the, the Mormon cowboy was just incredulous. Like, are you kidding me that because of what Jesus did, you have this? You betcha. Absolutely. He's, he's probably one of the most honest Mormons I've ever spoken to in my life. Love the guy. Wish I could run into him again with some backup. <laughs> <coughs> so point out that their whole eternity really focuses on that word if. If they do this, then they get that. What is the that that they get? It's the grace that's sufficient. And they'll admit that we have grace, or that we need grace, but there's an insufficient grace, and there's a sufficient grace. And the insufficient grace is the grace that kind of helps us keep the commandments, but the sufficient grace is that which covers everything once you have met the requirements for it. So again, we need to point out that we're not the ones telling them they have to be perfect. This is what Moroni is saying. Uh, they're, they're very familiar with Moroni's promise in Moroni 10, verses 3 through 5. Well, this is Moroni's last promise. If you do this, then you get this. The next verse that I, I often go to is 2 Nephi 25, 23. This is probably the most notorious verse in the Book of Mormon. And Mormon scholars particularly those from BYU, have been trying to distance themselves from the obvious meaning of this verse. And I actually heard a new one uh, a couple of days ago. I'll tell you about that in a second. First, I'm going to read this. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved, comma, after all we can do. Again, where's that focus? After all you can do. Okay, we, but to make it personal, after all you can do. 
Now, I heard a really creative interpretation of that verse uh, a couple of days ago. One of, um, heck, I forget who it was. But anyway, the Mormon that he was talking to, the Mormon said, well, you know, what that really means is after all we can do, we're saved by grace. Kind of softens the blow, right? After, after all we can do, then Jesus comes in and he gives us his grace. What he's done is he's reversed the order of what the verse says. And the guy who was talking to him did a great job because he immediately went to Moroni 10.32 and showed him the if-then statement. If this, then that. We've got the same if-then statement here, basically. I mean, it's a conditional. It's not uh, if-then uh, in the same way that uh, Moroni 10.32 is. But it is conditional because we're saved by grace when? Only after. It doesn't come before. Becky likes to, to ask the question, you know, well, what really is all you can do? I mean, how long did you pray this morning? <clears throat> Five, ten minutes? Could you have prayed six or eleven? <laughs> I mean, really, how, how far are we going to take this? Because I can, I, as I sit here before you today, I can honestly tell you that there isn't a day in my life that I've done all I can do. It's just not going to... I drive myself nuts if I tried to do all I could do all the time. I honestly don't believe we were created for that. <clears throat> Maybe created for it, but after the fall, something else happened. And, and that's just something that I'm, I'm incapable of doing at this point. Um, but you've really got to get them to see that it's, it's that grace and ask them to sometimes that you need to define words. You know, what do you mean by grace? What do you mean by saved? Because I've had Mormons say, oh, well, yeah, this is, this, everybody's saved. There was a guy last night saying that. Everybody's saved. What he's talking about there is general salvation. You guys understand the difference between general salvation and exaltation? Good. Okay, for those of you who are watching on YouTube who don't, General salvation is just resurrection, and everybody's going to be resurrected. Everybody with a physical body will be resurrected. That is done by grace. You don't even have to know the name of Jesus to be able to be resurrected. And it doesn't take any faith on your part because it's going to happen to you whether you want it or not. But the grace that's sufficient for exaltation, the grace that we need to be forgiven, that's different. In, the, in the, uh, the Bible dictionary, in the LDS Quad, defines grace as an enabling power. That's something that helps us do what we need to do. In other words, it's the power that we need to keep the commandments. So when a Mormon says in that sense that they are saved by grace, what, what they are saying is because of the power that God has given them to keep the commandments, that's why they're saved. They're not focusing on their individual efforts. They're focusing on that power that has been given to them so that they can do what they need to do. So in the mind of the Mormon, they can honestly say they're saved by grace, but they're not quite catching the part that it's still dependent upon what you do. It's still dependent on you as to whether or not you are forgiven. Now, I really focus a lot on this verse because I want them to see that it's only after you do. It, you don't get the grace before. It's only after. And uh, I mean, when my kids were really, really small, you know, I, I would tell my kids, well, you can only have your dessert after you're finished with your vegetables. I had one guy tell me one time, you know, you keep focusing on that word after. You're inserting a time element here. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> What else can the word after mean unless there's a time involved? But, you know, I told my daughter, uh, she's like three or four, I, I, I said, you know, honey, you're not going to get your dessert until after you're done with your vegetables. So she takes her plate, pushes it away, and says, I'm done. <laughs> no, that's not what I meant. Now, my son, he'll, he'll, he'll interpret that d differently. He starts double fisting it, you know. No. Just to be mean. Yeah, <clears throat> it's our job. Dads have to be mean sometimes. Keep, keeps kids on their toes. So, 2 Nephi 25, 23, again, it's a sticky verse, and Mormons have tried to interpret it differently. They've tried to say things 
like uh, we're saved by grace in spite of all we can do, which is kind of what the, the guy was saying the other night. You know, after all we do, we're saved by grace. But that is never how this verse is interpreted in Mormon church manuals and in general conference. Now, there's another uh, app I'm going to tell you guys about. It's called Citation Index. If you don't have it, download it. Citation Index. And the reason why that is so important is because what you can do is you can type in a verse out of, out of any of the four standard works. And what that app will do is it will tell you where those verses have been quoted in general conference. Now, why is that important? General conference is something that Mormons do once every six months. And I've heard countless Mormons tell me that their canon of Scripture is added to every six months. And what they mean by that is they are literally getting what they believe are the words of God through their prophets and apostles, their, their prophets, seals, seers, and revelators in general conference. So general conference holds weight to Mormons. So if you can show them where they have used certain verses in general conference and how that is applied, how that is interpreted, then it's no longer me telling them what 2 Nephi 25-23 means. It's their general authorities saying what 2 Nephi 25-23 means. <coughs> and it's never the way the guys at BYU say it. It's always the way that we're talking about it here uh, this morning. So uh, let's go to the next verse here, Alma 1137. I have a favorite chapter in the Book of Mormon, and this is it, Alma chapter 11, because there are three really good subjects that you can delve into. One God, the Trinity, and this issue here about forgiveness of sins. This one is important because of how it's interpreted and how you can get Mormons to see the problem. It says, And I say unto you again that he cannot save them in their sins. For I cannot deny his word. And he has said that no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, how can ye be saved except ye inherit the kingdom of heaven? Therefore, ye cannot be saved in your sins. Now, again, there's a number of questions I like to go through. Um, if Jesus won't save you in your sins, then in what condition do you need to be in before he'll save you? Yeah, what's the opposite of in? Oh. You've got to be out of your sins. And I had one Mormon tell me, well, if I can be out of my sins, what? why do I need Jesus? I said, that is a great question. And if my church taught that, I'd be asking more questions. Because this is supposedly about Jesus. Not my performance. What he did. What he did for me. Not what I do for him. I, have, I don't have the ability to please him so that I can earn my way, as that Mormon cowboy was saying. How did you earn it? I didn't earn it. It just blew his mind. He'd never, he'd never understood that before. Now, the distinction between in and from is this. You've got, if you're in your sins, that means you're currently guilty for them. From your sins, you're saved from your sins. Well, which sins? Which sins are you saved from? Spencer W. Kimball in uh, Ensign um, of October 1982, the article is called, uh, is called The Gospel of Repentance. He makes the distinction. Listen to how he puts it. But if we do not repent, then the Lord clearly lets us know that there will be discipline and a denial of blessing and advancement. The Lord teaches that he cannot forgive people in their sins. He can only save them from their abandoned sins sins. Wow. Yeah. Which is that? Um, it's Ensign October 1982, and the article is called The Gospel of Repentance by Spencer W. Kimball. So it's only our abandoned sins that God saves us from. Because if you haven't abandoned them, then where are you? You're still in them. So you've got to get out of your sins before he will save you. That's kind of like saying, you know, you've got to get out of the water before I'm going to save you from drowning. Right? Now, I use that later on as an example. Okay, my Jesus is not a swimming coach. He's a lifeguard. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. 
But that's very important that, they, that the Mormon gets that distinction in Alma 11.37. We're not saved from our sins. Only the abandoned ones. Because we're still in those sins. <coughs> wow, what a heavy burden. Where, again, where's the emphasis? On what he does? Or what I have to do? It's on what I have to do. Now, probably about a month ago, a month and a half, a month, a month and a half ago, uh, I had a sort of a revelation. Um, Becky and I were discipling a, a young Mormon couple who they left Mormonism a number of years ago, were starting to go back, and ended up in our church and just happened to come to our Sunday school class. We go to a mega church, okay? We're talking like, you know, upwards of 10,000 people over a weekend kind of mega church. So what are the odds that they're going to end up in our Sunday school class? Uh, we actually weren't there that Sunday, but based off of something that uh, the, the guy had said afterwards, our Sunday school teacher was sharp enough to understand that he was a Mormon, or at least with a Mormon background. And he said, you got to come back next week because there's this couple you got to meet. Well, we've been discipling them. And uh, the lady was, was listening to Becky talk about the gospel because they're, they're still kind of fuzzy on the gospel. And it occurred to me that, that there was still somewhat of a, of a language barrier that, that we were having. Because no matter how we were explaining the gospel... She was still saying, yes, I understand this. Yes, I believe this. But then she would say things that would communicate to you that she really wasn't getting it. And what occurred to me is that old school Mormonism has taught like the cowboy. Okay, rural Utah is totally different than uh, than a lot of other places, than Mormons in, in a lot of other places, especially, you know, Texas Mormons. It, they don't have the same culture. So old school Mormonism says, yeah, I have to work before I get, right? I have to earn. You heard him say it. He said the word earn. But our friend, when, when I, I asked this question, I said, are you telling me that you need to earn your forgiveness? That Jesus has done his work and you need to add to it because his work is incomplete. He's waiting for your part. Or that Jesus has done everything and you need to make yourself worthy enough to receive it. And she said the second one. And I said, okay, we've, we've made some headway here. Now in the mind of the Christian, it's the same result, okay? Because it, it's still dependent upon you. It's still dependent upon your works. But what we found out in that conversation is we needed to be more careful with how we were presenting the gospel because by saying things like, Jesus did it all, or I can't add anything to my salvation, she was agreeing with those statements. So we needed to reword it and say about your worthiness. What position do you need to be in before you can accept what Jesus has done for you? Oh, I have to do this, 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 and this. She wasn't making the connection. So I bring that story to you so that you can realize that maybe sometimes we need to be a little bit more careful in how we're wording things because the Mormon, it's, the Mormon that you're talking to may be the kind of Mormon who says, yeah, I just need to be worthy enough to receive, not worthy enough to earn. Again, same difference in the mind of the Christian, but a world of difference in how we are communicating that. You guys get what I'm saying here? Okay, good. All right. So let's move on to 1 Nephi 3.7. Now, this is actually the linchpin of the whole argument. All right, we've looked at three different verses, Moroni 10.32, Alma 25.23, or 2 Nephi 25.23, and Alma 11.37. Those all pretty much say the same thing. 1 Nephi 3.7 nails it down. Because they may say things like, I'm trying my best, I'm doing what I can, uh, you know, Jesus, I do my best, Jesus does the rest kind of thing. But 1 Nephi 3.7 puts a different emphasis on it. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, said unto my father, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. 
For I know that the Lord giveth no commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he commandeth them. Now I'll ask the Mormon, what does it mean? And this is a scripture mastery verse. So most Mormons know this verse, if not by heart. So I'll kind of play a game, especially if I'm talking with a bunch of teenagers. I'll say, you know, hey, it's a scripture mastery verse, so you should know this. And if you don't know this, you haven't done all you can do. They kind of laugh at that. And they say, well, how does it start? And I say, well, um, I tell you what, you know, I've got a quarter of the Book of Mormon memorized. And they say, really? You've memorized 25% of the Book of Mormon? Absolutely. And it came to pass. Now, I told that joke to a Mormon, and he said, actually, that's only 2.1%. I'm like, that's still a lot, you know. I can't believe he actually went through and figured that out, you know. The, just the fact that it appears so many times that he wanted to know the percentage, you know, that, that says something. Uh, but anyway, they'll, they'll kind of go through it. They'll memorize it, or, and, and they'll, it's almost like they race to see who can finish the verse quickest. And then I'll ask them, what does it mean? And then they kind of look at you like, well, gee, give me credit. I know what the verse was, you know. So you just ask the question, is it possible for God to give you a commandment you can't keep? And they say, well, no. Well, why not? Well, because it says right here, God doesn't give any commandments to the children of men, save he's going he's to prepare a way that they can do the thing that he wants them to do. So we call this the Nike verse, you know, just do it. You can do it. It's, it's all up to you. So that's how we nail this down, because the commandments God gives to you are the commandments that you can keep. Why? Because he's not going to tell you to do anything that you can't do. Did he tell you to deny yourself of all ungodliness? Yep. Did he tell you to do all you can do? Yep. Did he tell you that you can't be saved in your sins? Implying you've got to be out of them? Yeah. Those are commandments. So the very fact that he gave you that commandment tells you what about God and his expectations of you? Nike, you can do it. You can do these things he's told you to do. Otherwise, he wouldn't have told you to do it. So here's the golden question. How's it working out for you? How are you doing this? One of my old t-shirts, uh, Matthew 5, 8, you know, you know that be perfect thing? How are you doing with that? How's it working out? Oh, well, you know, that's kind of hard. You know, we, I'm only doing the best I can. Does this say to do your best, the best that you can? Well, no, but, you know, we all have, there's certain weaknesses I have that maybe you don't have and, and certain strengths that I have that maybe you don't have. So God doesn't necessarily expect uh, all the same thing. So are you telling me that God does not expect us to keep the commandments? Oh, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. So we do need to keep the commandments. Yes. Which ones? All of them. How often? All the time. We had a, a couple of sister missionaries in our home, and I asked her those same questions. How often? She says, all the time. I said, let me get this straight. Unless I keep all the commandments all the time, I'm not forgiven? And she says, I like it better the way I say it. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, I just have this gift or curse of boiling things down to its most simplest component. And if that's really what's expected of me, I've got to keep all the commandments all the time, then really, who is saved? I, one of my former t-shirts says, you know, I've never met a Mormon I know, who, or I've never met a Mormon who knows they're forgiven. That's the most offensive t-shirt I've ever created, right? It's really on the line there. I don't mind being on the line. I'm not going to cross it. But it's right there. I had a guy come up to me and say, you know, that shirt is offensive. I said, trust me, you'd be more offended if I took it off. <laughs> That's what he did. He laughed. Now, it's really hard for somebody to be mad at you if they're laughing with you. Right? So we had a good 45-minute conversation. At the end of the conversation, he still didn't like my shirt, but he liked me. 
And hey, that's a win in my book, right? But he understood the point. By the end of the conversation, he, under, he understood why I had created that t-shirt. Another kid comes up to me and says, I'm your first. I'm like, what are you talking about? Give me a context here. He says, your t-shirt. Oh, OK, I didn't realize what shirt I was wearing. You're my first what? I'm your first Mormon who knows that he's forgiven. I said, really? He said, yeah. So we kind of go, started going through some things. Are you still repenting? Yeah. Wait, of what? Sin? OK, so if you're still repenting of sin, then what does that imply? You know, because you can only be forgiven of repented sin, right? Right. So then are you really forgiven? He said, well, no, I guess not. I, I'm only forgiven of my repented sin, but I'm still working on the other ones. And I said, OK. He said, well, I know another Mormon. I said, who? He said, Jesus. Jesus was a Mormon, and he's forgiven. I said, of what? <laughs> he goes, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, you hear that phrase, Jesus was a Mormon, and everybody's like, anathema. No. I'm focused with forgiven. <laughs> For what? He's a sinless son of God. He's perfect. He didn't do anything wrong. So the t-shirt still holds true. I've never met a Mormon who knows they're forgiven. And yet they can do it. But they don't. Why don't they? You see, this is where we're going with this. I want them to see that they are expected to do this, but they don't have the ability to do it. They think they do, but they really don't. And that's what we're helping them understand. Uh, let me skip a couple of slides here just for sake of time. All right, Doctrine and Covenants, section 131. S sorry, let me phrase that. Doctrine and Covenants, section 1, verses 31 through 33. Uh, there's another video that somebody took um, where I'm talking with a, a Chinese Mormon named David. And, uh, and we were kind of going back and forth over these verses here. This says, For I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, he that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. Excuse me. Now, now check that phrase out. He that repents and does the commandments of the Lord. All right. Now, remember, the Mormons talking about grace as a power to keep the commandments. And that grace that covers repentant sin. Right. So if you repent reach that point of no return that Aaron was talking about yesterday in his dialogue, then those past sins are forgiven. What about the future sins? There shouldn't be any future sins. Why? Because you're keeping the commandments. He that keeps the commandments, all right? Who, he, he that repents and does the commandments shall be forgiven. So that obedience covers the future. If you're obeying, you're not sinning. So as long as you're on that track, then God is forgiving your past sin, right? So often what people will say is, you know, well, I'm trying, I'm, I'm doing my best. I, I'm, I, I can only do what, what God expects me to do, which is keeping the commandments. I'll, re I'll remind them and I'll ask them, have you ever kept a commandment? And they'll say, yeah. And I said, well, then that was your best. So have you ever really forsaken, and I don't want to get too personal with you, but have you ever really truly forsaken a sin? And I had a Mormon tell me, yeah, smoking. I, I used to smoke and now I'm not a smoker. And I said, great, that's awesome. Now, what about all the other sins? Because you're, you're forgiven for the, the, the sin of smoking. But what about everything else? You've got to work on those kinds of things. And I don't, I don't, stick it in their face like, you know, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, whatever. But I want them to understand that this is what's expected of them, according to Mormonism, is that they've got to forsake each sin. Now, often what they'll say is, but I can repent. I can, I can repent of my sins. Ask the question, what does repentance mean? It's usually divided into five sections, okay? Sorrow for sin, abandonment of sin, confession of sin, restitution for sin, and doing the will of the Father or keeping the commandments. The one that we focus on the most is the abandonment of sin. There was a guy I talked to uh, last year who was 
not quite getting this right. And so what we did was we likened this to a pie. All right, and there's five ingredients to this pie. And unless you have each of those ingredients, what you're making is not a pie, it's a mess. And one of the most important ingredients is the abandonment of sin. Because what happens if you don't abandon your sin? You're not forgiven. Because you're still in your sins. Psalm 1137. So you've got to abandon those sins. <coughs> Excuse me. So... So what's, what's good to go to sometimes, and uh, you guys can go to it, it's DNC 58, 42, and 43. I don't have that in my slides here. Um, we're not seeing your slides. I know, you're not seeing my slides, but I don't have it. And what I'm saying is I don't have it in my notes, so I'm making this up as I go along. No. But DNC 58, 42 says, By this you may know if a man repenteth of his sins. Behold, he will confess them and forsake them. Confess and forsake. So if you don't forsake, then that means you didn't really repent. So ask the question, is it possible to be forgiven if you haven't repented? Well, no. Okay, so, it, so how do we know that? How do we know if someone's truly repented? They've forsaken their sin. And I had a Mormon lady tell me one time, that she didn't sin for a year. Yeah. We're sitting in the park, in the Manti City Park, and I'm, I'm under the pavilion there, and I've got my laptop in front of me, and I'm writing out some prayer requests that I'm going to email to my mom so that she can send them out to our team back home who are praying for us. And uh, there was this family that had camped out in the, in the northwest corner of the park where all the Christians normally hang out, you know, called the Christian ghetto, affectionately, right? Well, this family evidently didn't get the memo and, and uh, pitched their tents right amongst ours. And usually, most, most Mormons only stay for one night, then they're gone the next morning. Well, this, this family was on a, a family reunion, so they stayed for more than one night, and it didn't take them very long to figure out who we were, you know? You're, one, you're wearing one of these in, in Utah, and they know who you are, and they don't like you. Or if you're wearing a Christian t-shirt, okay, I know who you are. So she was upset with her adult daughter. And she's like practically yelling at her while she's underneath the pavilion on the other side of the pavilion. And she says, but don't they know about James chapter 2? Faith without works is dead. Her daughter evidently got tired to listen to her and went into the tent. So this lady marches right over to me and sits down right in front of my laptop. And I'm thinking, Lord, I'm on this mission trip. I'm trying to get things done with you. You keep giving me these Mormons to talk to. <laughs> so we talked for like a couple of hours. And that's when she laid it on me that she hadn't, because we're talking about repentance. And she says, I haven't sinned for a year. And there's two normal responses to that. You know, the first of which is what you guys are all thinking now. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't want to be like that. Yeah, I want to be like that, right? No way, Right. And then the other response, if you're a Mormon and you believe her, is, whoa, wow, I want to be like that. How do I do that? Well, I didn't have either response. I've been accused of being able to think outside the box, and I don't know what box you're talking about. <laughs> so I looked at her and I said, I said that's horrible. She said, what are you talking about? I just told you I didn't sin for a year. I said, ma'am, I know. I heard what you said. But I... It's going to be one of the worst things I've ever heard in my life. She says, what are you talking about? I told you I didn't sin for a year. I said, ma'am, why, why'd you start again? You've just shown me the difference between temporarily stopping sin and forever forsaking sin. And of which are you required to do? And she said, to forsake my sin. Now, what I said next is going to sound really harsh, but she understood me. I said, and ma'am, you don't have a whole lot of time left because she's like in her 80s. She was not offended by that because she knew that, that by that time that I, I genuinely cared for this lady. But she made that distinction very clear that the forsaking of sin is what counts, not the temporary... The temporary um, Stopping. It's the forever forsaking. 
Some Mormons will say that, oh yeah, I repent every day. And they're proud of that. I don't get that. Why are you proud of sinning every day? Well, I didn't say I sinned every day. Well, then what are you repenting from? Joseph Smith himself said that daily repentance is not pleasing in the sight of God. It's in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. So Mormons should not be happy with the idea that they are repenting every day. This is something that needs to be taken care of in this life. And Alma 34 explains that. This is a long passage. I'm going to read through this. Hope my voice holds out. So flip to Alma 1130, or sorry, Alma chapter 34. I'm going to read the whole thing, and there's a certain phrase that I want you to keep count of, okay? The, the phrase or form of the phrase, this life. All right, so, uh, for behold, this life is a time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is a day for men to perform their labors. And now, as I've said it to you before, as, I've, uh, as ye have so many witnesses, therefore, I beseech of you that you do not procrastinate the day of your repentance until the end. For after this day of life, which is given for us to prepare for eternity, behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can no labor be performed. Ye cannot say when you are brought for that, to that awful crisis that I will repent, that I will return to my God. Nay, ye cannot say this. For that same spirit which doth possess your bodies at the time that ye go out of this life, that same spirit will have power to possess your body in that eternal world. For behold, if you've procrastinated the day of your repentance, even until death, behold, you have become subjected to the spirit of the devil, and he doth seal you his. Therefore, the Spirit of the Lord hath withdrawn from you and hath no place in you, and the devil hath all power over you, and this is the final state of the wicked. Mormons use this passage to other Mormons who are threatening to leave Mormonism. And they use it by saying, if you leave Mormonism, this is your fate. Sealed to Satan. But this isn't just about leaving Mormonism. This is about those who have yet to complete their repentance. What does completed repentance look like? The abandonment of sin. Remember, it's those five steps. They've got to accomplish those five steps. Otherwise, they are unrepentant. And what happens to unrepentant Mormons? They're not forgiven. Now, the Mormons thinking, it's okay, I can get a lower kingdom, you know, lo lower level of kingdom. The Book of Mormon doesn't teach this. The Book of Mormon teaches that you're either with God or you're with the devil. Subjected to him. Even more importantly that, sealed to him. That word is very important to a Mormon because they want to be sealed to their families for all time and eternity. It's all about the family. I had a Mormon tell me that last week. It's all about the family. I said, no, it's all about Jesus. I'm adopted into God's family. It's not about me having my own family being sealed together. It's a big difference between Jesus and earthly families. But to think that for, I'm forever sealed to Satan? That's a daunting thought. I asked the kid, a 16-year-old kid, I said, have you, have you completed your repentance? He says, well, no. I said, well, how long have you been a Mormon? He says, I got baptized when I was eight. I said, so you've procrastinated your repentance for eight years. And, you know, he'd never thought of that. Now, of course, I'm not expecting an eight, you know, 16-year-old kid to completely conquer his sin problem. But according to Mormonism, it's possible because God isn't going to give you a commandment that you can't keep. Notice this says that it, it's the final state of the wicked, not temporary. It says there's no labor performed there. So you can't work. Now, there are some general authorities who will say that you can repent in the afterlife. It's contrary to what the Book of Mormon says. But there are teaching manuals that say, yes, we can accomplish our repentance in the afterlife. But they always say two things in the process. They'll tell you that you can't do it here. Right? It's impossible to do it here but we can do it in the afterlife. So I ask the question, how do you do this in the afterlife? And they'll go into detail about, well, you know, it's kind of hard to, to repent of certain sins because certain sins require a physical body. So you, it's harder to repent of those kinds of sins. Um, 
but we're able, we're able to do that. But, but it is harder in the spirit world. I said, well, let me, let me get this straight. It's impossible to do it now, but it's harder to do it in the spirit world, and I'm looking forward to that? They haven't put that together in their minds. So they're looking forward to doing something that's harder than impossible. If it's impossible in this life, how in the world can I do it in the next life when it's harder? They haven't thought of that. Ask the question, are you comfortable with your position before God right now? Knowing that you're still in your sin. Knowing that you're still repenting. Not that you have repented past tense, but that you are still repenting present tense. Are you comfortable with that? Knowing that the Book of Mormon teaches that you're going to be sealed to Satan. Let them wrestle with that. Lay that part on thick. Your whole eternity hangs on the word if. If you do this. It's all that you can do. You've got to be out of your sins. You can do this. God isn't going to look at sin in the least degree of allowance. He's not going to give that to you. Because He holds these sins against us. We're only saved from our forsaken sin. Not the sins that we're still committing today. Under those conditions, really, who can be saved? At that point, they're able to listen to your gospel presentation. Because they want to know, how do I get out of this? This is a mess. How can I do this? So you're able to preach in a way that they are, their defenses are down because they want to hear, how can you do this? How in the world do you know you're forgiven? I like to take them to Romans chapter 10, and, and we'll end with this. I'm going to read it out of the New American Standard just because that's the translation that I like to read um, the most. This is, uh, again, Romans chapter 10. I like to refer to Romans as the most inspired book of the Bible. My wife thinks it's Hebrews. Now, this is Paul talking to Israel, all right? But this could be us talking to the Mormons, all right? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal of God. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, does that sound like Mormonism? And seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. It's about trusting in what Christ has done and not trying to make ourselves worthy to receive what He has done. We are not worthy to receive it. John tells us that we are enemies to God. Is it John or Romans 8? I don't remember. One of those. I know that Ephesians says that we are sons of disobedience. We are, we are enemies of God. Children of wrath. And God saves us in that condition. Actually, it is Romans chapter 5. Um, well, that's, cha- that's verse 8. The one I'm referring to is... Um, Yep, I went to eight again. Flip over. I told you it was one, one more, but I lied. Romans chapter um, 5, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. That is a foreign concept to Mormons. Mormons think of themselves as children of God. The Bible says we're His enemies. Outside of Christ, we are His enemies. Make that point to them. Have you ever considered yourself an enemy of God? Well, no. What what does Paul say in Romans? If God can save me while I'm an enemy, how in the world can I make myself worthy? How in the world can I earn it? I can't. That's God, and I've got to come to Him on His terms. By faith, coming to Christ, knowing that the work He did for me is enough. Jesus is sufficient for all that I need because I can't do it myself. So that's all. I've probably gone over a couple of minutes extra. Um, If you guys have any questions, um, catch me afterwards. I love to teach on this subject, and Mormons do get this if you spend enough time explaining it. So uh, let me close in prayer, and then I guess you've got more announcements. Lord God, thank you for, um, thanks for this opportunity, and thanks for all the Christian missionaries who are out here. Lord, I pray that you would give us great conversations tonight. 
that you'd bring out uh, Mormons who are going to match up with us pers personality-wise, that you would keep the enemy off the streets, and that there would not be any contention whatsoever. Uh, please continue to heal those of us who have not been feeling well and get us out there in, uh, in your full strength so that, you can, so that we can do your work. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.